How's it going, First Unitarian? This is Theo E.J. Wilson, and I'm honored to come before you this Sunday to have this very necessary conversation. Of all the people that I have had the privilege of speaking before, it's the folks in this audience who I have seen time and time again not only talk the talk, but walk the walk of making substantive change in the world. And so uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Leah, shout out to uh, Reverend Mike for inviting me in to this service today. And I can't wait to get started on this topic, this topic that's been brewing in my head for quite some time. And the topic that we're going to be discussing today is around a crisis of faith. Now, I know that a lot of religious leaders have discussed what a crisis of faith looks like in this country. Um, But what I think is ironic is that since the very beginning and the founding of this country, the government had the audacity to call the church a faith-based institution. That's funny to me, as if both institutions did not operate on the undergirding strength of human belief. And so when you lose faith in your religion, when you lose faith in your worship body, what do you do? You change locations, you uh, seek out a new group of congregants and fellowship, you read new books, you find yourself in new company, right? But what happens when you lose faith in your government? Right. I'm not talking about just losing faith in your party, the Democrats or the Republicans or whatever third party, but faith in the entire government as a whole. Right. Well, it's not as easy, obviously, as just shifting your house of worship or the folks that you congregate around because it is everywhere. Whenever you buy something, the very government that you lost faith in is taking tax dollars out of that purchase. They are not as easy to escape as a religious body, right? And so what happens to folks is that, I don't know, maybe they sit out an election like 100 million American voters did last time, only to wake up to a country that is barely recognizable from the country that they went to bed at last night, right? And so one of the things that happens is that we find distractions, right? Uh, Whether those distractions look like, I don't know, uh, going to the movies, but, uh, you know, hobbies, live music, karaoke, uh, gatherings with friends, uh, barbecues, restaurants, you name it. Anything to keep your mind off of the task at hand, sports, right? Uh, Attending baseball games, football games, and all that works until a pandemic comes. And that pandemic wipes out all of those other areas of your life that you had a chance to vent and escape from, right? And if that weren't bad enough, the pandemic just doesn't take the fun away, but it takes away your most necessary institution to actually participate in this society. And for uh, about 50 million of us, that was our jobs. It was our jobs. Right. It was the literal lifeline that we have to the economy, which in and of itself is a faith based system. And we want to do everything that we can to help those who might be vulnerable to this pandemic. Right. We stay home. We shelter in place. We try to create social distance and we try to create a narrative in our own communities that says, come on, everybody, let's all play together so that we can get life back to normal. But that comes at a cost. And the cost is when you distance from one another, you are literally in defiance of one of the most essential human needs, and that is closeness with other human beings, right? That's stressful. We've seen rates of domestic violence, child abuse go up in these times when we haven't had the ability to actually connect on a very human level, right? It was tender. It was a dried out set of leaves in a forest. It was, it was a brush fire waiting to happen. And all it needed was a spark. And unfortunately, we got that spark in the loss of life of George Floyd, who on camera for eight minutes and 46 seconds was suffocated beneath the knee of a law enforcement officer. Somebody was paid to serve and protect. And we've had a lack of faith in that institution for quite some time. And that was it. Everything began to be put in context about what it was that we have faith in and what we have lost faith in. And it seems that one of the last things that we all have faith in right now is our ability to make a change for the better. 
if we didn't believe in that ability. You wouldn't have seen marches and protests and heck, even riots in all 50 states. And one of the things that came out about the state of the world that we live in, it was stated so articulately by Trevor Noah, is that we have lost faith in the social contract that binds us all together as a society, and specifically for African Americans. The faith in that social contract has been damaged since 1690, right? Since the time that we were first put aboard those ships and brought here, the American dream has been for many and most of us an absolute nightmare. And what was happening during this time period was that there was a narrative being crafted about America and what America was supposed to be, these high sounding lofty ideals that made us the envy of the world in certain respects, the a very experiment in democracy, constitutionally based republics that could have elected and rotating leaderships with a peaceful transition of power were literally a threat to the power structures at the day the monarchies and the kings and queens of Europe and all of those were power players in the world. But these high sounding lofty ideals were made in direct contradiction to the lives of those who built the physical empire of America. The men and women who were brought over in slave ships from the continent of Africa, who I am fortunate enough to call my forebearers, could, did not get a chance to enjoy these freedoms that were promised to them in the Constitution. And for years, for centuries, we've been fighting to make these ideals a reality. We've called this fight the American experiment. And with any experiment, it has the opportunity to fail if we don't get it right. Somebody once said that we hallucinate the idea that our democracy is around 200 and 44 years old around, right, since 1776. But was it really a democracy if women couldn't vote? Was it really a democracy if black folks couldn't vote? Was it really the land of the free with so many millions of people, human beings in shackles? Were we really the uh, home of the brave when through cowardly acts of genocide, the indigenous population was systemically removed from these lands? The reality of America and the reality of, so we say, the dream, this lofty ideal that we want to have be reality has always clashed and is clashed in the lives of folk and what was uh, black folks and what has not been talked about is that when you don't overcome these original sins of the country, then they replicate themselves and they play themselves out in due time not only to those who are underprivileged, but to those who have privilege as well. What is done to the hood will be done to the burbs in time. What is done to black bodies will be done to white bodies in time. And we begin to see this creeping in in certain patterns that have interrupted the promise of America via the breakdown of these institutions. When the Second World War was over, there was a large and powerful welfare state that was created. These institutions that were supposed to undergird the middle class of America never to allow such a financial and economic hardship ever to happen again. The issue was that at those times, black folks were locked out of that, right? You couldn't get the loans to appreciate your house. You couldn't necessarily participate in the GI Bill if you were a black soldier who was returning from war, right? And we were comfortable in that hypocrisy. And when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 comes into play, we see now finally full participation, at least on the legal level, of black people in the promise of democracy. And what also happens at that same time, a new narrative that says these social safety nets that were put into place to undergird the American worker are being exploited by so-called welfare queens and leeches on the systems and dog whistle marketing made it seem like those folks looked like me and before long, the very people who these systems were made to undergird and protect began to vote these protections away, right? And when they needed them, when we needed a robust welfare system, when we needed 
folks who were able to actually benefit from food stamps, when we needed there to be Medicaid intact for everybody, when the financial crisis of 2008 came down the pike, we had those who were in the upper crust and the upper class not able to take advantage of the very things that were there to protect them because generations prior, they voted them away. And now you have the same crisis of conscience and identity that we have always had as black Americans. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, we may have come here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And that's what's going on right now, because as these institutions have failed us and got into the practice of failing black America, then they began to slowly fail white America. When police brutality and oppression, systemic racism and tyranny is practiced in the streets of Ferguson and in the streets of Baltimore, it's only a matter of time before they come to the neighborhoods who are more affluent. When these systems begin to fail, the lower class workers, those of us who are working class, those of us who are blue collar, those of us who have probably not had the same education, but are willing to work. When the capitalistic addiction to fast money that was forced on the plantation becomes the backbone of corporate culture, you see an erosion of the very things that were supposed to promise the American dream. And right now in this time, we have the opportunity to redirect the American dream. We have the opportunity to recreate these institutions. It took fire sometimes to bring light to the situation at hand. And all of these things that have been breaking down in America subtly, but not for everybody, for this group, but not for that group, for these groups of people who have been affected by the hypocrisy in America, they began to lay the tender on the forest floor. And for so long, we've tried to stop forest fires, but it turns out that forest fires are actually healthy for the forest without a burning, without a letting off of smoke, without an incineration of that which is unneeded. Again, you don't have room for more life. And that's what we're here fighting for today. Right now, we're at a watershed moment. We're at a place in time where we could create something different. We have the opportunity and the political will now to shape institutions that have failed us into being successful. We have the opportunity right now with all of this unemployment to find actual work that we enjoy doing and to reassess our agreement that jobs and labor equal money. Perhaps there's another system at hand that we can create from the ashes of the old one. But now is the time to start thinking about what the future looks like because we still have faith in our own spirits and our own hearts. I know I do. I know that that's all I've had. I know that when I have been in hard and trying times in my life, the only person looking back at the only person that I could depend on was someone looking back at me in the mirror, right? And we can do this because when we start to think that all of this cannot be done, we have to remember our ancestors who would look at the world that we live in today and say, that's impossible. It can't be true. The fact that you can get from Los Angeles to New York City in five hours, one of our ancestors would say, that's impossible. It can't be done. If I said to one of my ancestors, you know, I can talk in real time to someone in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, over a vehicle called Skype, they would say, what's Dubai? What's United Arab Emirates? What's Skype, right? These things in our world that we take for granted were once the dreams of those who came before us. And when we realized that they had the grit to change the world in a way that they would never dream of, understand that we still have those capacities latent within us. All it took was a crisis for it to bring out our creativity. Does that make sense? We have to be able to have amount of pressure necessary to forge the diamond that we want to shine in this coming future. And as much as it is difficult, it's also a blessing. I see the blessing in disguise. I understand that there is a possibility that before us right now are the raw materials to build the heaven on earth that folks have been wanting for so long. But what needs to happen is that no matter how good our technology gets, no matter how much we upgrade our devices on the external world, it's time to take a look at the internal world. Because these 
toxic systems, these systems that have broken people, these systems that exploited and harmed and destroyed people were a manifestation of the very consciousness of the people who invented them. And right now we have the chance to look within, to create something better without. There is an awakening happening. There is a rising of the awareness that we are actually all connected beneath the surface, beneath our differences. What binds us together is so much more powerful than what separates us, that when we invest more and in what separates us, we have a decreased return in that investment. Does that make sense? We don't have the same return. We don't have the same, uh, should we say, um, flowering of hope, of beauty, of the things that we need. When we look at the things that have separated us for so long, I always said that the greatest crime of racism was that it's just a waste of human potential. I mean, literally, Folks hung from trees that could have been scientists, doctors, engineers, architects, inventors that could have enriched our society to a higher level. And now we have the chance to reevaluate that agreement all the way to the dirt and build something new because the consciousness that is arising in folks wants something that matches our very best intentions. And I know that I'm talking to folks who are willing to fight to make that happen. This crisis of faith will turn out to be something that is more creative and vibrant than we can ever possibly imagine if we do the right thing with this moment that is before us. Thank you very much for your time and listening to me today. I'm Theo E.J. Wilson. You guys have an amazing Sunday.